Hi, this is Dominic Pace, who plays Gekko the Bounty Hunter from The Mandalorian, and you are listening to Star Wars Comics in Canon. Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 60. So guys, this week I'm bringing something special and brand new. It is the War of the Bounty Hunters prelude. So what this is, is there's going to be a 34-issue crossover event between the four main ongoing Star Wars series, which is Star Wars, Bounty Hunters, Darth Vader, and Dr. Aphra, all intertwined with a couple of one-shots as well as an ongoing mini-series called War of the Bounty Hunters. So for anyone who hasn't tuned in before, in brief, there are going to be spoilers. So I go through each of these comics, and there are five of them this week, I go through the narratives, explaining sort of the general basis, like the footnotes versions of the story. I may read out a little bit of dialogue, but generally speaking, this is meant to give people who haven't read the comics enough information so they get an understanding of the story, while also allowing people who do want to read the comics to still get something out of reading them. So there's going to be certain dialogues I skip over, certain little scenes that I kind of glaze over as well. So this is meant to serve as both perfect for people who haven't read the comics and don't intend to, perfect for people who are refreshing themselves have already read the comics, but also I'm going to be connecting the dots between other Star Wars content and giving more information on certain things, such as the characters and places that pop up in here that you may recognize. I will specifically tell you in canon where they connect and where you may have heard of them before, as well as giving just bits of trivia and stuff that I quite enjoy too. So this is the spoiler warning beforehand, and... For full clarity, this is the second run of Star Wars, the first run of Bounty Hunters, the third run of Darth Vader, and the second run of Doctor Aphra. Now on this show I have tackled a lot of these previously, I haven't yet touched upon the Bounty Hunters, but these all start between issues 10 and 13 of these ongoing series, so the preludes, the point of them is to finish the sort of the story arcs they were on and introduce them into the War of the Bounty Hunters crossover. Now, the reason I mention this is just in case anyone is reading the ongoing Star Wars, Bounty Hunters, Darth Vader, or Dr. Aphra comics, this will bring minor spoilers because it is going to end the story arcs that this sort of prelude takes place in. So I want to preface that of anyone just saying it's going to spoil War of the Bounty Hunters somewhat, and also it may spoil some story arcs that you may already be reading at this time. So I'm going to be doing this monthly, and I'm aiming to do it about a month after the issues have come out. So what I should do is anyone who's like me who gets the issues ordered to themselves as soon as they come out, it should give you ample time to read those issues and listen to this with a lot of fun. But yeah, as I said, it's going to be only about a month afterwards, so that is your warning. Anyway, guys, let's get into the information about the comics involved before we get into the narratives. So the reading order for these is going to be War of the Bounty Hunters Alpha, Star Wars 13, Bounty Hunters 12, Darth Vader 12, and Doctor Aphra 10. And for clarity, as I said earlier, this is set just after Empire Strikes Back. In the timeline, Empire Strikes Back is set at 3 ABY, which is three years after the Battle of Yavin, which is when the Death Star blew up. And that's a good way for us outside of the Star Wars universe to determine when things happen in the timeline. And for clarity, Return of the Jedi was only a year after Empire Strikes Back, so that was 4 ABY. So all of these War of the Bounty Hunter comics are going to take place between three and four years after the Battle of Yavin. So let's go on to the first issue. So this is the War of the Bounty Hunters Alpha, which is before issue number one. It is called Precious Cargo. It is written by Charles Saul. The artist is Steve McNiven and the colour artist is Laura Martin. This was released on the 5th of May 2021. And I'm going to be tackling the crawl for each of these issues I tackle. So here is the crawl for Bounty Hunters Alpha. Boba Fett, the galaxy's most dangerous hunter, claims the bounty of notorious smuggler and rebel officer Han Solo. Jabba the Hutt eagerly awaits Fett's delivery of Solo's carbonite frozen body to Tatooine, where the crime lord will exact his final revenge. Han Solo's debt is thus paid, but Boba is desperate for a payday himself. I just want to quickly clarify that I will take photos of the covers of these issues and the crawl as well. I'll be posting them on my social media at Genuine Chit Chat, which you can find on Instagram or on Facebook. On Twitter, I'll put a couple, but obviously limited with photos there. So if you want to see what some of these covers look like and the artwork and all of these issues are fantastic, make sure you check it out on social media. So with all that in mind, let's get on to the narrative of War of the Bounty Hunters Alpha Precious Cargo. 
So it starts with Boba Fett on the Slave One, and he speaks with Bib Fortuna. So, a little bit of backstory on Boba Fett. He is an unaltered clone of Jango Fett. He was born 32 years before the Battle of Yavin. For clarity, him being an unaltered clone means that he doesn't grow any quicker. The clones from the Clone Wars, like famous ones you'd know of, like Rex and the guys from the Bad Batch in theory, they all grow at double the rate of a normal person. So every year, they basically grow by two years. Boba Fett is not like that. He is an unaltered clone of Jango. And so I just wanted to clarify that I've been asked that question before. You see Boba Fett in Attack of the Clones for the first time as a kid, and then he's also in episode 20 of the second season of The Clone Wars, where he tries to exact his revenge on Mace Windu for killing Jango Fett. And I want to clarify, I know in Legends, in the holiday special, Boba Fett does technically appear there first, and obviously in the original trilogy, that's when we first saw Boba Fett, but chronologically speaking, Attack of the Clones was when we first, in air quotes, saw him. And in addition, he was in some of the comics as well. He is actually in the first volume of the main run of Star Wars comics from the 2015 run, and I tackled that on episode 9 of Star Wars Comics and Canon. He is also in the first volume of the 2015 Darth Vader run, and that is episode 15 of Star Wars Comics and Canon where I tackled that. Boba Fett was the person who found out that Luke Skywalker is the name of the person who blew up the Death Star. He reports that back to Darth Vader after the events of A New Hope, obviously, and then that's how Vader actually knows about the survival of his child for the first time in Canon. So I thought that was quite cool. And also in episode 43 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, I do tackle a little bit of more information about Boba. Boba Fett because I tackle the Age of Republic Villains comics, which are a batch of one-shot comics from the original trilogy era, and they're just yeah one-off comics about stories of the villains, unsurprisingly. So if you want more information on Boba Fett and you want to find out everything he's ever been in in canon, those are some of the places you can start. He is also in the first arc of the Bounty Hunters comics, which was out 2020, and obviously in this big crossover, it does tackle the Bounty Hunters comics, but you know a couple of arcs after Boba Fett showed up in that. So I just want to clarify that's kind of a bit of information about Boba Fett. Now the slave one is obviously Boba Fett and Jango Fett's famous spaceship and the model of it is actually the Fire Spray 31 class patrol and attack craft or it's known as the Fire Spray class interceptor for short. The Fire Spray was a patrol ship generally used to guard and patrol the prison moon of Uvo 4, but Jango Fett and Boba Fett customized their own Fire Spray to make the slave one so it's got a lot of cool things that the normal ships wouldn't have. So that's a little bit of information about them. Now on to Bib Fortuna. He is a Twi'lek, or Twi'lek, depending on how you pronounce it, and his homeworld is Ryloth. Now, Twi'leks, you know, they've got the Leku, which come out of their heads, which is the tentacle things, basically, first shown in Return of the Jedi. And you can actually see him in The Phantom Menace as well. When there's the pod racing scene, I think he whispers something to Jabba towards the end when Jabba's, like, falling asleep. He also has a cousin called Beezer. Now, Beezer actually shows in Rogue One. He's one of the partisans. And one of the fun little bits of trivia is that he was actually nicknamed the cousin of Bib because he was the same species and looked quite similar to Bib Fortuna. So Pablo Hidalgo, the guy at the top of the story group who often sorts out a lot of the things for canon and the visual dictionaries and whatnot, the little bits and pieces of canon that don't get mentioned within the films, he actually decided, well, if he's going to be nicknamed cousin, he might as well just be the cousin of Bib Fortuna. So if you want to watch Rogue One and spot a Twi'lek or Twi'lek who looks like Bib Fortuna, his name is Beza and he actually is his cousin. So anyway, to continue, Boba Fett was speaking with Bib Fortuna over comms and things, saying that he's on his way with Han Solo to collect his bounty. Then some alarms go off, and the carbonite starts to almost look like it's thawing a little bit. Boba Fett comments that nothing is ever simple, and then he heads to the moon of Narshadar. Now, Narshadar is the moon of the planet Nal Hutta, which is in Hut space, unsurprisingly, and Nal Hutta is where the huts come from. Now, Nar Shaddaa was first in Star Wars Legends, but in the canon, it was first shown in the second volume of the main run of Star Wars comics. I tackled that on episode 13 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, and the episode is called Showdown on Smuggler's Moon. Now, Smuggler's Moon is the nickname of Nar Shaddaa, which is fairly self-explanatory. So on Nar Shaddaa, Boba speaks to Doc Ragon, R-A-G-O-N. Now, Doc Ragon is actually a Besalisk. Now, a Besalisk is an alien species with four arms, and the most famous one that you guys would recognise is Dexter Jetster, which is one of my favourite characters in the prequels. He is the one who is very friendly to Obi-Wan Kenobi in Attack of the Clones, who he meets in the diner, and he points Kenobi in the direction of Kamino. And I think they're called Besalisks. I wouldn't be surprised if that's because the connection to a basilisk, which is, you know, a giant snake thing um, in a lot of mythical cultures and things like that. Obviously, in Harry Potter, you see a basilisk. So the Besalisks in Star Wars, they've got like scaly skin, kind of, but they don't really look very snakish. But I wonder if that name kind of connects to that. But anyway, so Boba Fett is speaking to this Besalisk called Doc Ragon. And Doc says that he can help out Boba Fett. You know, Han Solo is slowly unfreezing in the carbonite, but not in a good way 
way he's actually slowly dissolving and if he doesn't have any help soon then Han Solo will basically just become goo. Doc needs payment up front which Boba doesn't have and he suggests that he could help him out instead of paying him. He mentions the Kanji Huts. Now, Kanja Club is an offshoot of that, and you may recognize that from The Force Awakens, when Han Solo and Rey and Finn all get connected, and Han Solo has got all those Wrath Tars, those giant tentacle things, Kanja Club are one of the gangs that confront him. Kanja Club, the leaders of that, are actually two actors who are in the Raid films. But for clarity, Kanja Club was about 31 years after the events of this comic. So from what I can tell, they were the Kanja Huts. And then after, you know, decades, eventually they kind of splintered off into their own gang and became Kanja Club. So Doc wants Boba to take out Wyman Lichter. Wyman Lichter is the champion and Doc wants to take him out because he put a bet against her and lost loads of money. So he now has a grudge. So he says if Boba takes this person out, then he'll sort out Han Solo. So Boba Fett sprays his armor black so he doesn't get recognized, and he goes to the arena. He speaks to a woman at the desk, and her species is and her species is Pa Lowick. So a Pa Lowick, you may recognize them from Return of the Jedi. There's a lot of connections to these, and it's a character called C. Snootles or Cy Snootles. It's the singer in Return of the Jedi in the slightly infamous remade scene, where it's that kind of vaguely jarring song in Return of the Jedi. And also, you actually see her, the same character in Clone Wars. She's in this story arc with Zero, which is like a spiritual successor arc to the Clone Wars animated movie, and. She is actually part of the Max Rebo band. Um, she is obviously their singer. So she's got the long snout thing and the strange looking lips at the end. That is a Pa Lowick. But this attendant person doesn't seem to be that same one. Boba Fett enters and calls himself Django. Obviously he's a homage to his father and this has been decades since Django's time so people clearly don't recognise it. And obviously his armour is sprayed black which doesn't look quite the same even though, you know, Mandalorian armour would be quite recognisable one would assume. But still, the attendant confirms to Boba that if he wins he gets triple the entry fee back. So it then has this really cool double page spread where Boba Fett fights and kills four combatants in the arena. It's surprisingly graphic, but it looks incredible. It's some really, really cool artwork. I really can't recommend people check this out enough. And after Boba beats these four people, he can then fight the champion. Someone warns him about it, saying how dangerous it is, but then also says that he'll get 10 times the prize money if he manages to win against Worman. And so he fights them. Now, I couldn't find confirmation of what species this creature, Worm and Lictor, is, but they're basically a spider person. Now, it's not like the spider person, the general in the Clone Wars. It's actually more like if anyone has seen the Doctor Who Christmas special, The Runaway Bride, and there is the Rachnos, that spider woman. She looks a little bit like that, but it's kind of like this... Imagine like a human woman with like an elongated head, kind of like the xenomorphs from Alien, and then has a gigantic spider body attached to sort of the back. That's kind of what this person looks like. So they have this big fight and things. I'm not going to go into the intricate details of that, but unsurprisingly, Boba Fett wins. He comes out the arena and then the Kanji Huts say that they won't give the winnings over to Boba Fett. Instead, he can try and fight again and win them back. He doesn't care. He says, look, you can just keep that. I'm not fussed and walks away. Before Boba gets back to Doc's place, someone sneaks in and kills Doc and then takes Solo and then leaves. Boba enters Doc's workshop, finds that Doc is dead, and then he contacts Jabba, confirming that it's going to be a minute. And so that is where the War of the Bounty Hunters Alpha ends. And I've clarified there are going to be another five issues of the miniseries, War of the Bounty Hunters, as well as I'm going to be tackling all of the other connective tissue around it. So we'll move on to the next issue, which is Star Wars number 13. And I want to clarify, guys, this is the second run of Star Wars, which started in 2020, not the run from 2015 to 2019, which I am also tackling on the show at the moment, which I'm near the end of. So Star Wars 13 is called The Hunt for Han Solo. The writer, once again, is Charles Saul. The artist is Ramon Rosanas. And the colour artist is Rachel Rosenberg. And this was released on the 12th of May, 2021. So let's get into the crawl for this issue. The Rebel fleet awaits words from their missing comrades. Shara Bay, lost on Starlight Squadron's first mission, and Han Solo, frozen in carbonite and in the hands of the infamous bounty hunter Boba Fett. A friendly signal from the Imperial Star Destroyer Tarkin's Will reaches the redemption in the middle of the night. Shara is alive, hiding in the depths of the ship and gleaning information about the Imperial systems. But the Rebellion still seeks Boba Fett and his cargo. 
So this issue starts off with Luke training with a yellow lightsaber. Now that was obtained in the previous issues of the Star Wars run. Just in short, he got it from an old Jedi Temple. It's a Jedi Temple Guard lightsaber, which is why it's yellow. And you can see Jedi Temple Guards in the Clone Wars bombing arc, as well as in one of the episodes of Star Wars Rebels. While Luke is training, you know, he's deflecting a lot of things, he's doing a lot of force use, and he's just showing that he's becoming a lot more competent with the force. C-3PO interrupts, and it doesn't actually bother Luke. He says that, you know, her Jedi's mind is meant to be calm, and if you get interrupted by something as small as a hello, and that distracts you, then you're clearly not doing the best job. So you can really see how much work he's putting in, and how far he's come. 3PO is there because he's trying to translate for R2-D2. R2 has some more information for Luke, but before he can relay it, Chewie enters. It turns out that Chewbacca has a contact on Nar Shaddaa, who spotted Boba Fett, and Chewie wants Luke to go with him. Luke mentions about Lando going, but Chewie doesn't fully trust Lando, so the four of them go, the two droids, Chewie and Luke. They mention that Leia is busy with the other rebels, trying to find the other divisions after the Battle of Hoth, which was seen by the Rebel Alliance as a loss, and obviously they're trying to scramble to find another base of operations. So on the way there, 3PO says he's thrilled because he's fulfilling his primary function, which is to translate, and R2-D2 is still trying to bother C-3PO to tell Luke about the information he's got, but C-3PO won't because he says it's just R2-D2's gossip and the mission at hand is more important. They get to Nar Shaddaa on land, Luke comments that he hasn't been on there for a while, which is referencing in Volume 2 of the first run of Star Wars comics when he went there and met Gracchus the Hutt, which is a cool story, as I said slightly earlier, I tackled that on episode 13 of Star Wars Comics in Canon, and Chewie meets up with his contact and it is actually another Wookiee called Sagwa. Now you would actually recognise Sagwa because it's from Solo, a Star Wars story. So in the movie, when Chewie is in the spice mines of Kessel, when Han, Lando, L3 and that lot all go to the Spice Runs of Kessel to get the unrefined coaxium, you see Chewie actually save and rescue quite a few Wookiee slaves. And one of them, the way I differentiate them from a lot of other Wookiees is Sagwa looks a lot like Chewie, but in the face has a lot of grey in the face, not on the fur itself, but sort of the skin on the face is a bit more grey. You would recognise Sagwa, and I just want to clarify that after the Empire took over, they enslaved the Wookiees, which is obviously a horrendous thing, and Wookiees live for hundreds of years, are incredibly strong and very durable and they have a lot of obviously strength and things so yeah the empire uses them as slaves quite a lot so sag was very pleased about chewy because they've been in contact since solo and they are good friends they are not blood related but they consider each other to be family which is nice they see this large hollow projector in the streets of Narshadar, and it shows that someone called Django has just beaten the champion. They kind of look at it and say it looks a lot like Boba, but they can't be certain and they don't recognise the name of Django. Sagwa says to go and check the records, so they go to where the Pat Lowick is, and it confirms they need to pay to even find out. There's a little cool mottos here that C-3PO says. They're like the mottos of Narshadar, and he lists off like three or four of them that are quite funny. I'm not going to read them here, but if you read the comic, it'll make you giggle. So it turns out that the Pat Lorick attendant has no information and then presses a buzzer. Shortly after, the Kanji Huts come over and threaten our little gang. Luke ignites his lightsaber and then the gang start opening fire on Luke, Chewie, Sagwa and the two droids. Luke is easily deflecting all of the blaster bolts while the Wookiees are shooting back, which then draws even further attention and the Kanji gang then summon even more reinforcements. Sagwa takes them through some sort of back alley, they manage to escape a little bit, they then get surrounded and Luke pushes a speeder which then causes enough disruption and distraction for the gang to sort of get out of the way and then steal the speeder. After stealing the speeder they manage to get to the Millennium Falcon, Luke is on the front like deflecting blaster bolts and things with a saber which is quite cool and then it shows that once the guys are out of the vicinity Kanji then inform the Imperials of the Jedi because there's a quite a high bounty or high reward on Jedi if you report them to the Imperials. Sagwa then joins the rebels and then R2-D2 confirms the information he's got for Luke. So it turns out that he's actually got some former Jedi outposts. He actually managed to take them when he took information from the Death Star back in the events of A New Hope. But they've been so busy and keep getting split apart and all these sorts of things. There hasn't been a good time for R2 to go through it and then to be able to, you know, give it to Luke. Luke takes notes of all of these things and says that they'd be able to search the galaxy for decades finding all these bits of information out, which is essentially what Luke ends up doing after this trilogy. And this issue ends with Leia sending a message to the gang saying that an unknown party has got Han. So there's lots of cool panels in this comic and things. A lot of them are to do with Luke, you know, deflecting blaster bolts and showing off how much of a Jedi he's becoming and how much more attuned with the Force he is. But as I always say with these sort of things, I don't really explain action scenes to you guys. I want to give you guys the general premise and ideas of what the story is telling along with connective tissue. But if you want every detail, including the mottos that are mentioned in this, some of the really, really cool dialogue and some of the brilliant visuals, yeah, please pick up these comics. They are excellent.
So with that all in mind, let's move on to the third issue in this little crossover, and this is Bounty Hunters number 12, and this is called Target Solo. Now the issue is called Target Solo, and that is actually a reference to the Target Vader miniseries. So I think it's a six-part comic series. I tackled it in episode 49 of Star Wars Comics and Canon. It was written by Robbie Thompson. And in essence, it's about Baylor at Valance, who was in the Han Solo Imperial Cadet comics as well. He basically was in the Imperial Academy with Han. In short, Han saved his life. And then in Target Vader which is the name of this miniseries. Baylor Valance is then hired to try and take out Vader. He teams up with Dengar, who's another bounty hunter, to try and do it. And minor spoilers for that, obviously, Baylor Valance does not kill Vader, unsurprisingly, because target Vader is set between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, and Dengar then betrays Valance, and they're not on the best of terms. But as I said, that's a cool comic. If you want to pick that and read it, I would recommend it. But if you just want to hear about the general story and get some background information on Valance, then I would recommend picking up yeah, target Vader. It's only six issues, and I believe it's on like Marvel Unlimited and things, so you can check that out. Anyway, Bounty Hunters 12, Target Solo, is written by Ethan Sachs. The artist is Paolo Villanelli, and the colour artist is Arif Prianto. And this issue was released on the 19th of May, 2021. So with that all in mind, let's get into the crawl of this one. Cyborg Bounty Hunter Valance recently rescued a stranded rebel freighter from marauding pirates. Dengar let it slip that the notorious Boba Fett captured Valance's old friend Han Solo. The rival hunters have come to an understanding in order to find Fett. Valance now tears through space in a stolen vessel, desperate to pick up the trail before it's too late. And just to clarify, Dengar is a character that you first see in Empire Strikes Back. He is also in a couple of Clone Wars episodes, and in those he is voiced by Simon Pegg. And also, by The Rise of Skywalker, he actually becomes a character called Rothgar Den, which is basically just Dengar who has had so many cybernetic enhancements, potentially due to him maybe dying several times or those sorts of things and they have to keep kind of upgrading him he's become this being that isn't quite what he used to be but there's not very much information on Rothgar Den and for clarity as well Dengar does also appear in the Aftermath trilogy which is set just after Return of the Jedi so that's the information on Dengar so onto the narrative of Bounty Hunters 12. It starts off with Dengar and Valant in a ship going after Boba Fett. They get pursued by Zuckus and Forlom, who start shooting at them. Zuckus is a Gand, which is the name of his species. He's kind of like a bug-eyed humanoid thing. And Forlom is a protocol droid and the creation of the LOM, LOM, protocol droids. They are created by the species that Zuckus is of, the Gand. And the protocol droids' heads look a lot like the heads of Gand. Now for clarity, these two guys are in The Empire Strikes Back. They're in that same scene with Bosk, Dengar and Boba Fett and etc when Darth Vader's rounding up the bounty hunters to pursue Han Solo. So they are also after Han Solo for the large bounty. So while they're getting shot at, Dengar puts a blaster to Valance's head asking why Solo is so important and then you get to see a flashback. It shows that Valance was desperate for credits and takes a job from someone called Cavaness. Cavaness tells Valance to meet him at the space dock and that the Pikes have been anonymously tipped off to his whereabouts and they are looking for him. To clarify, the Pikes are part of the Pike Syndicate. Uh, they're in the Clone Wars quite a lot. I think they're in Season 7 a little bit as well. And they're actually in Solo, a Star Wars story. When I mentioned earlier in this episode where Chewie meets Sagwa at the Spice Mines on the planet of Kessel, the person who greets Kira and things, who's got those sort of tube things coming out of their face, that's one of the Pikes. So Valance manages, after some tussling, to get through the Pikes and then heads for the port for the, in air quotes, smuggler. Cuts back to now and it shows that Valance is flying his ship through an asteroid field, avoiding exogorths. Now exogorths are giant space slugs in Empire Strikes Back, the one that the Millennium Falcon flies out of, that's what an exogorth is. Dengar, while Valance is flying, is getting quite sick of all of this, so he just cracks Valance in the back of the head with his gun. And then does another flashback, continuing the story. When Valance meets at the port of Cavaness, he has a rifle. It's like a sniper rifle. He's aiming at the port and so are three others, being told that they'll get hold of the comms once their target comes nearby. Valance then sees that the target is actually Solo. He cuts back to now and Dengar is speaking to Fallon and Zuckus, asking them to not shoot and they're searching for this girl that isn't there and that Dengar actually has better information. Now the girl they're speaking of there in the previous arcs of this Bounty Hunters run, uh, they are quite good and quite interesting and also if you want more backstory on Valance, as I said, you can read Target Vader or if you read the first 11 issues of Bounty Hunters, it does do quite a bit of flashbacks that does basically lightly touch on those events as well. It goes back to the flashback and showing that Valance actually shoots behind Han and Chewie and it hits a thug. 
Han then dives out of the way, clear that obviously people are trying to shoot at him, and he comments on the fact that he, you know, you drop cargo for the huts one time and you never hear the end of it, which is quite funny because in the entire of the original trilogy, when Han is trying to escape bounty hunters, all that is for is, yeah, because he dropped some spice, which is worth a lot of money. Han and Chewie manage to, you know, sort of shoot their way out of the situation, and while that's happening, Valance is then tussling with Cavanus, trying to prevent him from killing Han Solo, and Valance gets thrown off a roof. He does manage to land, it's a bit of a hard landing but he is okay, and Solo sees him doing that and thinks that Valance is trying to kill him, and as Chewie pulls Solo onto the Millennium Falcon, Solo is yelling that he thought that we were friends and that he saved his life. As in Solo saved Valance's life, and that's all in the miniseries Han Solo Imperial Cadet, which is set in that sort of few year period in Solo when he goes off to join the Empire. The Millennium Falcon flies away and Valance says that he is sorry and then it cuts back to now and it shows that Dengar gives Zuckus and Forlom information on where Boba Fett's location is. He confirms that Jabba put on a massive bounty onto Boba Fett and so Forlom and Zuckus leave. And this comic ends with Dengar saying that every bounty hunter is going to be after Boba Fett now so we need to hurry up and get him. Valance isn't too thrilled at the fact that Dengar hid the reason that he was helping him was just for the money of Boba Fett but they continue to agree to work with each other. And yeah, that's where that episode ends. As I said, there's a lot of space battles and shooting and things and a lot of cool dialogue with um, Zuckus and whatnot. And obviously Zuckus and Forlom in the canon don't have that much backstory. So it's quite interesting seeing them interact with people. So that's quite cool. But yeah, they're the sort of footnote details. So let's move on to the next issue, which is Darth Vader number 12. This issue is called Into the Trap. It is written by Greg Pak. The artist is Guiu Villanova. And the color artist is Dean White with help from Gieda Marchizo. And this issue was released on the 26th of May 2021. So let's get on to the crawl. Emperor Palpatine finally reveals to Darth Vader a mere glimpse of his power on Exegol. It was enough to make Vader kneel before his master once more. Darth Vader is beginning to understand the full scope and might of the Emperor's plans for the galaxy. Now Vader's own plans must also change. So once again, this issue finishes off one of the previous Darth Vader arcs. In one of the parts in the arcs, he went to Mustafar and he was fighting with a Sith assassin called Ochi of Bastoon, who is in the Rise of Skywalker. He's actually in all the flashbacks in the Rise of Skywalker when they find that Sith blade and things. Uh, that is Ochi of Bastoon's. Now, Vader fights Ochi of Bastoon, actually burns his eyes with his lightsaber, which is why Ochi has these weird eye implant things in the flashbacks in Rise of Skywalker. So it's quite interesting getting a little bit more information about Ochi. And also, Vader was becoming very defiant of Palpatine and was questioning his power and his loyalty and all these sorts of other things and so Palpatine basically threw him on Mustafar, threw loads of people I am trying to get Vader killed to try and teach him a lesson. Vader escapes, manages to track Palpatine to Exegol with the Wayfinder and then confronts him. He confronts him, Palpatine basically shows off how powerful he is and Vader can't really do anything about it so Vader kneels once again. So this comic starts just after that. Vader lands on Coruscant and his suit is quite heavily damaged. Palpatine says to restore his suit, saying that everyone wants to kill him, but he's put Vader in his place on Exegol. He's talking to his subordinates, one of which is Mars Armeda, and he confirms that Vader knows his limits now, so repairing all of his stuff will actually only benefit Palpatine. One detail I noticed was that Vader wants to be awake while his suit is getting fixed because he finds power in the pain that he suffers. While this is happening, he's thinking about how the pain didn't lead Luke to hate, and Luke is actually weak. He specifically, you know, cut off Luke's hand, put him through all these pain and things, trying to get him to tack a pin to the dark side so he'd become more powerful, but he just wasn't doing that. And it's confirmed that Luke doesn't do anything without his friends. There's several little flashbacks of A New Hope, you know, showing that if it wasn't for Han, then shooting Vader in the Death Star trench, then Vader would have killed Luke before he blew up the Death Star. Lots of little bits and pieces like that. It then does a flashback to some time ago, and... Vader is in a spaceport and he sees what looks like the Millennium Falcon. He then goes near it and it turns out that Han and Chewie are right there. They quickly see Vader, get on the ship and fly away. Vader then pursues it in his TIE fighter and then Han and Chewie land in a YT series shipyard. And the Falcon fits in perfectly because the Falcon is a YT series Corellian freighter. So the Falcon goes there, lands, then when Vader lands and tries to look around, the Millennium Falcon flies off and escapes. It then cuts back to modern day where Vader is still pondering and thinking or meditating, however you want to put it, and it's now showing some flashbacks from The Empire Strikes Back. It says that Vader thinks that Luke didn't actually save his friends. It wasn't strength or fortune that's made the Rebels come this far. It was all by Vader's design. And it shows some flashbacks of like, you know, Boba Fett lifted up his rifle to shoot Chewie near the end of Empire Strikes Back, but Vader put his hand on it and told him no. And there's lots of little parts where Vader basically could have quite easily killed the Rebels, but decided not to to try and test Luke. Vader then awakens and shortly after that Ochi is also about because he's had his eyes all sorted for those strange implant things. 
and Palpatine tells Ochi to go off of Vader. Vader asks Palpatine what to do next, you know, in the standard way, what is thy bidding, my master? And Palpatine says, well, you're a Sith now, you've been renewed, so, you know, go out and decide for yourself. So Vader thinks to himself that Luke now must die, he probably can't be turned, he's tried a lot of different things, so now that's his last option. He needs to see the true might of the Sith, as Vader did. So then the last few pages show that Ochi of Bestoon approaches a new hut called Boku the Hut. It's just in a place in the Outer Rim, so we don't know explicitly where it is, but Ochi says that Boku will retrieve Solo and give him to Darth Vader. Boku questions why that is, and then Vader appears, and that is where that comic ends. So that was a bit of a shorter one, but quite a lot of the 2020 run of Darth Vader issues are sort of flashbacks to the prequels and the original trilogy and things. Obviously not Return of the Jedi because this is set before that, but it's showing sort of Vader's thoughts on certain things that either Anakin or himself went through. It's quite interesting. It's it's really, really good. I do enjoy them, but obviously rereading over all stuff for me isn't that exciting. And you guys, you know, go read it if you want to find out all those bits of information. But there's some cool dialogue in this. And one of my favorite things about the recent Vader comics is whenever they've got his speech bubbles, his speech bubble is black with white writing, whereas everyone else's speech bubble is white with black writing. I just quite like that effect. It kind of helps me be a bit more immersed into the comics. But yeah, so it's basically just Vader's decided to go after Han because he's in essence trying to get to Luke and what better way to do it. So with all that in mind, guys, we move on to the final comic in the preludes of the War of the Bounty Hunters special. And this one is Dr. Aphra number 10, and it is called The Invitation. It's written by Alyssa Wong, the penciler is Ray Anthony Height, the inker is Victor Olazaba, and the colour artist is Rachel Rosenberg, and this one was also released on the 26th of May, 21. I want to clarify that this is the second run of Dr. Aphra. The first run of Dr. Aphra is excellent, I think it started in 2016 and was started off by Kieran Gillen. And for clarity for the full Afro experience, you can either listen to there's a Dr. Afro audiobook that does like lots of her comic appearances from like her perspective and her story, or you can read the 2015 run of Darth Vader comics by Kieran Gillen, which introduces her as a character. And then the Dr. Afro comics kind of pick up from where those 2015 Darth Vader comics end. And then the Dr. Afro comics finish, Empire Strikes Back happens, and then the Dr. Afro comics pick up from there. So let's go on to the crawl of this Afro comic. Rogue archaeologist Dr. Aphra is working for Domina Teg. The job? Steal experimental hyperdrive tech from Domina's rival, Beale Deruyat. To get it done, Aphra has recruited smuggler Sana Staris, but the ruthless General Vakara and her unbroken clan syndicate are also after the hyperdrive. The trail has led Aphra and Sana to the D-Root Center, where Beale plans to demonstrate his prototype. Bad news, it's a dangerous fake. Even worse, Vakara's arrived, and she's taking hostages. And just to clarify, Sana Staros is a character who's quite prevalent in the main run of Star Wars comics. She does pop up in the Afro comics as well, but she knows both Dr. Afra, who she had a prior relationship with, that the details of which haven't been disclosed, and also she knew Han Solo quite well as well. If you want more information about her, make sure you check out episode 13 of Star Wars Comics in Canon, because that's where I tackled the second volume of the main run of Star Wars comics, the showdown on Smuggler's Moon, which I mentioned prior in this podcast, because that's where I give the introduction to Sana Staros, because that's where she first appeared. Or rather where she was first identified. She appears briefly in the first volume, but you don't know who it is. So what was alluded to in the crawl, Afra basically there's these whole story arcs about Afra trying to get these artifacts and then betraying this guy, and then he turned out to be the niece of this Dominatag, and so she made an agreement with Dominatag to steal this special hyperdrive tech. And it is actually hyperdrive tech of the Nile, who are one of the main antagonists in the High Republic era. They could travel through hyperspace using different methods than the standard hyperspace lanes that most people use. And for clarity, just to briefly explain how hyperspace kind of works in Star Wars. The way everyone would use it would almost be like driving a car on a road. You want to make sure you're going in a route that isn't going to collide with planets or other things that would get in your way, because if you're going faster than light speed and you hit something, you will just get obliterated. Now, what the Nile have is the path engine, which means that they can go through hyperspace and this engine basically allows them to go routes that other people don't know about that they kind of create in their own. I think one description for it was almost like describing like a forest. If you're walking through the forest, you've often got sort of gravel paths and things, which are all already walked across quite a lot and you can walk along those roads and you don't have to worry about things those are normal hyperspace lanes however what the nile do more so would be walking through the forest land you know going through the bushes and in between trees and things like that and although those routes can be a lot quicker and things people don't know about them and therefore 
you know, you can't use them, especially when you're going faster than the speed of light. So then I will just have this method of traveling through hyperspace, going ways that other people don't have to go down. And that's what this path engine is. And in the High Republic era, it seems like the Nile are the only people who've got that tech. And by modern era, those types of technologies don't exist anymore. So presumably the Nile died with all of those things. But we don't know how the High Republic stuff ends. And if we did, I wouldn't spoil it all here. It's going to be years before we find out the ending of that. But I just want to clarify that it connects quite nicely to the High Republic stuff. But if you want to know more about the Nile and paths and things like that, you can either check out my Light of the Jedi book review, which is on YouTube or on the feed of Comics in Motion. It was released on the 13th of March. So it was between episodes 47 and 48, chronologically speaking. But on YouTube, they're in playlists anyway. So just go for book reviews there. I give some general background on the Nile and all those sorts of things in that. Or you could just read The Light of the Jedi, which is an excellent book as well. So let's get on to this Afra story then. So on Midar, they're at a tech expo and someone is said to have had a Nile hyperdrive bit of technology. This person's meant to be showcasing it in front of all these rich people going to invest and the people have been taken hostage by Vukura. They're threatening a guy with the technology and keep on killing onlookers and employees and things, trying to get this engine to work so they can take it and then have this massive edge in the galaxy. The engine is very unstable and Afra and Sana are kind of watching from the side without being discovered. Afra wants to bail, but Sana convinces Afra to help, so Afra asks Sana to go and find an exit while Afra kind of stalls. Afra then approaches Vukura and says that she'll help, and asks to not be killed if she does assist, and Vukura says nope, she'll kill her last, and then when Afra tries to protest further, Vukura then just shoots another person. While this happens, Sana manages to find some hostages, beats up the thugs that are holding them, and then finds the exit. All of the hostages that Sana found and herself manage to get out, tell some stormtroopers that are outside, and the stormtroopers all go in, because the stormtroopers weren't trying to act because they were hostages and whatnot. It then cuts to a side story with a character called Just Lucky and a friend of theirs called Ariole. And Just Lucky did appear in other episodes of this Afra run. I'm not going to delve into the ins and outs of their character because it's only in this Afra run. So if you want to find out more about them, re- read the previous nine issues of the 2020 Afra run by Alyssa Wong. But essentially they were in an alleyway, they've just killed some thugs and it turns out they were sent into a trap. The trap was meant to kill them and then it was going to be used to send a message to the Sixth Kin, which is the name of another crime organisation. When Delphis is the crime lord of this organization and Just Lucky's brother owes them a lot of money in gambling debts, which is why he's working with them. Back to Afra, she is fixing, in air quotes, the engine, basically just trying to stall while waiting for Sana to find an exit. Imperials then enter and the stormtroopers start opening fire. In all the commotion, Afra manages to take out this green glowing crystal thing out of this engine and then starts to leave. Just as she gets a little bit away from the engine, a stray bolt hits the open panel, which is what Afra had been working on, and it does cause an explosion. Afra manages to dive behind a table taking shelter. She doesn't get hurt by the explosion, and then once the dust has settled a little bit, Sana Staros appears and manages to help her up. Afra confirms that she disarmed the engine, but at the moment everything is on fire, because although she took out the green crystal thing, it means that the core itself isn't as explosive but it's still a big ship so there is things in there that can explode so there's the imperials shooting out of these thugs from the unbroken clan syndicate and in all commotion san and staros try to leave they manage to get out of the entrance and come out the front and vokora is chasing them sana shoots behind and manages to get vokora in the eye but it seemingly doesn't kill them Sana and Afra escape and then they go and meet Domina Taig. Domina is angry about the engine because Afra destroyed the engine and then she almost kills Sana because of it but Afra reveals she kept the power crystal thing and gives that to her. Domina Taig then offers Afra and Sana Staros a new job. They need to find her cousin called Aban. He went missing after he apparently has this massive opportunity and she wants Dr. Afra and Sana to go out, find out exactly what this opportunity is and feed the information back to her. After Afra and Sana leave, Domina Taig speaks with a colleague of hers and it confirms that there are moles in the Taig Corporation and it turns out also other competitors in the same market have been having the same issue with moles. Back on the ship, Afra confirms to Sana that she copied the data from the crystal and she does this because then she knows what's on there but she said it's just loads of corrupted mess and you can't really make odds or ends of it but if Domina for some reason does want to do that then she'll probably have to contact Dr. Afra again. It then goes back to Just Lucky and Ario. They are told to kill a traitor who is going to be at the same place that Afra and Sana Staros is going to be. But Just Lucky and Ariel don't know that Afra and Sana are going to be at this place. But it turns out that there are moles in both legitimate and air quotes corporations and also in crime families and things. So there seem to be just moles everywhere and they're all converging in the same place. 
And the very last panel shows Afra and Sana, just like in Ariel, heading somewhere. And there's a character called Dirge, who is actually in the final panel. Now, that is the end of the comic, but I will give two quick pieces of information. Domina Taig, you may remember the name Taig because she is actually related to General Cassio Taig. Now, Cassio Taig, he is in A New Hope, and he actually protests the Death Star's usefulness and says that when the Rebels got a technical readout, that they're in incredible danger. Shortly after that, he leaves the Death Star, so he doesn't die when the Death Star is blown up, and he is actually an antagonist in the 2015 Darth Vader run. He is constantly just taking advantage of Darth Vader because he gets promoted to a rank that Palpatine kind of considers to be higher than Vader in some ways. Vader has to keep doing what Taeg wants, and Taeg just, yeah, takes advantage of him. Vader does eventually kill Taeg in the end, which is a minor spoiler alert, but this comic was years ago, and I did tackle it on the show a little while back. So you would recognise Cassio Taeg, but Taeg comes from the Taeg Corporation, which is this big multi-billion credit family who do indulge in things that are you know not strictly speaking legal but are generally from the outside seem to be a legitimate business and last of all the character dirge now dirge is actually in legends they're in the star wars republic legends comics which are you know based i think before and around the clone wars and things which is quite interesting but the way i actually first saw dirge was actually in the 2d animated micro series of clone wars so people may remember it's made by the guy who made samurai jack and they are actually now on disney plus under vintage star wars i remember having them on dvd there's not very much dialogue in them but they are 2d cartoons many of the episodes are like a couple of minutes long but they all kind of you know merge together together into one big event and it was basically the clone wars before the 3d animated clone wars got made and dirge is this scary looking it's like a giant person in knight in shining armor not quite so shining but you know this knight of the round table sort of armor but it's made by this weird thing that i mean dirge is like thousands of years old like even older than mars kanata and yoda and if you slice his arm off then these weird tentacle tendrils come out of where the slice was and then the tentacles pull with the other tentacles and fix him so he's seemingly like immortal in some ways or there thereabouts i presume if you burnt everything of him or bombed him enough he probably could die but he's very very hard to kill and in legends that was definitely the case so it's quite exciting that he's coming into the forefront of the canon again and yeah that's basically where the prelude crossover event all ends so thank you as always for listening guys i really really appreciate it i hope you guys enjoyed my run through of the war of the bounty hunters prelude comics so that is the first volume there are going to be six of them Uh, there are going to be a few more comics in the other ones as well and i'm going to be releasing these once a month so anyone who does get the comics ordered has plenty of time to read them now i would like your guys feedback on this one because all the other comics i've tackled on star wars comics in canon have been out generally for a little while at the time of recording and i just want to see what people thought of the amount of detail i was giving and the amount of things i was skipping over it's generally the same as my other episodes but i want to know if anyone is reading the current comics or anything like that if you had any thoughts on that matter but in addition to that what have i got coming up and what sort of things am i involved with going forward So next week's episode number 61 is going to be the 11th volume of the main run of Star Wars comics called The Scourging of Shu Torun. Then after that, we're just going to continue the story and that is actually one of the last volumes of the main run of Star Wars comics. I think there's only going to be a couple more months of that and then I'll be fully caught up in that regard. The week after that is going to be episode 62. That's going to be me tackling the first batch of the 2017 Darth Vader run by Charles Saul. That is set after Revenge of the Sith. So it's Vader kind of dealing with himself being in the in the suit, uh, getting his red lightsaber, doing his fortress on Mustafa. Loads of really cool things. So I'm excited to talk about that. And also I'm going to be tackling in the Comics Motion Book Club, which you guys should have heard an advert for at the start of this whole episode, where we're going to be doing a monthly thing where we just talk about comics and the host is going to choose the comic. It doesn't have to be indie. It could be Marvel, DC, Star Wars, anything people want. I started this kind of show off vaguely, so I'm doing the first episode, and we are going to be discussing that Vader run. So it'll be ideal on the feed of Comics in Motion. You get to hear me talking about the 2017 Darth Vader run, specifically the first volume, giving, you know, connective tissue information and all that sort of things, while similarly at a similar time, while at a similar time we're going to be releasing the first episode of the book club which is myself tony dave and potentially some others talking about our opinions on it so obviously this show is very quite analytical and connecting things together not necessarily giving my full opinions on things very much the book club is specifically going to be giving my opinions on those sort of things so excited to release that then the week after that so number 63 i have not fully figured out what i'm going to do then i think it would probably make sense to do the finale of the dr afro comics which is the run that set before what 
I've been tackling here, the War of the Bounty Hunters. So that'll be the 2016 Dr. Aphra run. So I'm going to finish that, I think. So that'll be episode 63. Then the week after that is likely to be the next War of the Bounty Hunters, which is going to be the first full proper volume of comics, which I've I've had a couple of those sent in to me thus far. And so by the time of obviously recording that, I'll have got all of the comics and I'll be able to give loads of information on those too. And then obviously the week after that, it's going to go to the next volume of Rainbow and Star Wars comics. And then after that, I haven't fully decided. I think I may embark on the Poe Dameron comics as an ongoing series. Uh, and then it'll only take like two more months after that. And I'll have finished the main run of Star Wars comics. And the Darth Vader comics aren't that far either. So in a couple months time, I will basically be caught up with most of the ongoing series. And I'll have done, you know, already done all the mini series and all of the one shots too. So it's a very exciting time over the next month. Uh, in addition to that, guys, please make sure you check out the description because I've got information of all the places I've been guesting recently. Um, I've been on the I Like to Like Things podcast, which is amazing. It's one of my new favorite shows and we speak about my favorite TV show. It's nothing to do with Star Wars, actually. My favorite TV show isn't that. Um, but we do talk about Star Wars a fair amount at the start. Uh, the host, Chris, is amazing. And they release one episode each week, which is going to be, you know, having the guest on talking about what they like and then the week after they release a response edition which is after they've consumed that content and give their thoughts on it so that's very exciting i also appeared on episode 21 of the geek talks podcast which is on the fantastic universes feed uh link to that is in the description as well and yeah there's just a few other bits and pieces i've been involved with links in the description to that like my appearance on the 20th century geek the i like the sound podcast and a few other bits and pieces there so that's generally what i'm getting up to and you can also support the show on patreon.com slash genuine chit chat for as little as one pound a month you get access to the afterthought show that myself and megan do we do that at least once a week often twice when i release like certain episodes and things in a certain order and so we talk about some of the star wars movies the marvel ones non-star wars we, we tackle things each episode and you know we've done ones on the witcher little miss sunshine 27 dresses the thor movies the captain america movies cruella mitchell's versus the machines we've done quite a big variety of things and we're watching a lot more movies recently and we're going to do like a big recording session this weekend and i think get quite a few of them sort of recorded and sorted so that'll be in the bank so if you want that for one pound a month you get like several hours of extra content that's really cool but you also get access to unsplit episodes of genuine chit chat which is my other show if you want to go to genuine chit chat it's on its own feed i talk to a different guest each episode i've had matt from classic comics on i've had tony on i've had most people in comics emotion on there actually to talk about nerdy things but also talk about a lot of things that aren't nerdy that I'll talk about music and well movies are supposed to is subjectively a bit nerdy uh talk to actors scientists uh entrepreneurs all kinds of different people so if you want to support that show as well i often release episodes you know i release episodes weekly but sometimes when they're really long episodes i split them into part one and part two but patreon supporters get access to a special rss feed which has all of the afterthoughts episodes on there as well as any episodes i do that get split into two you get access to both parts in one unsplit episode when part one drops if you don't want to contribute financially to the show but you do want to get some free stuff go over to patreon.com slash genuine chit chat anyway there are now three episodes on there completely for free that is season one of the witcher review spoiler free uh, mine and megan's views on star wars the phantom menace after re-watching it god knows how many times and i've also just released spider-man 3 we spoke for half an hour about spider-man 3 megan was not a fan and it is hilarious but if you want to just hear our conversation on spider-man 3 completely for free you don't have to make a patreon account or anything like that i've included a link in the description it is literally just bitly b-i-t dot l-y slash spider-man 3 a t you have to make sure the capitals are for the s of spider-man and then the a t at the end but if you type that in it will just take you straight to the patreon post where you can listen completely for free and if you listen to it and you like it and you want a bit more of that then as i said you can just contribute one pound a month which is a huge huge difference to me and you get access to all of that additional content too so lots of waffling from me thank you as always for listening guys especially up to the end i really really appreciate it i will speak to you guys next sunday with the next batch of star wars comics and as always guys May the force be with you.